many people will associate the name Sutherland when they see this force of nature. New Zealand's second largest waterfall that bears his name. As you're about to find out, there are Sutherland's fingerprints all over Fiordland. And there's so so much more to his life story. How a gruff Scotsman became a reluctant New Zealand tourist pioneer. Let's now go back to the beginning. Scotland was where he was born in either 1843 or 1844. No one knows entirely. Prior to his hermit-like stint in Fiordland, Sutherland was, to somewhat underplay the term, a wanderer. Running away from home at the age of 12, fished for a bit, then joined a quasi-mercenary unit of Scots at the age of 20 and found himself fighting up the boot of Italy under Garibaldi. Back home he went to sea, which led him ultimately to end up in Port Chalmers in 1862. No sooner had the anchor dropped, he deserted and headed into the Otago goldfields, which, like his future mineral explorations, didn't end up well, and he went north to put his military training to good use, enlisting in the 3rd Regiment of the Waikato Militaria in December 1863 saw action in the messy Mary Wars before he had a gutsful and deserted again. And getting away from it as far as he could from the scene of the battle by prospecting in southern Westland, which, you guessed it, went nowhere. Soon found himself back up north with a gun at his side, a member of the armed constabulary trying to keep peace in and around New Plymouth and Tauranga. All this before we get to the real story. It was now 1877 and Sutherland was aged 33. He had taken a shine to the untouched Milford Sounds via his time on the coastal steamer Stella. Thought it could be a place he could plant his roots away from all the other pesky humans. Find a fortune in undiscovered gold, diamonds and rubies. Asbestos or baronite, a rare type of greenstone. In December of that year, he sailed with his dog, Johnny O'Groot, in a small open boat, just think a glorified lifeboat, all the way from Port Chalmers via the Fovo Strait up the southern coast and into Milford Sound. Arriving in Milford on the 4th of November 1877, he would spend 99% of his life there for the next 42 years. Milford Sound Village would also become his final resting place. And what was at Milford when he set ashore? Nothing. It was a town in name only. He was it. The Homer Tunnel connecting the town to Tiana wouldn't be built for another 76 years. His first project was to construct a hut made out of a tent, slabs of dirt and thatch. Outside, he put a tongue-in-cheek sign which said D. Sutherland, Number 1, Rotorua Street. The only contact he had with the outside world was the steamer he had served on, and that called every three months. Such was the isolation that despite keeping a diary, needing to be in the town with a ferry or random boat called to get provisions and not out foraging, he still lost track of time. He was now the king of all he surveyed. Fished, hunted and explored for the untapped mineral wealth he knew was around the next bend. Bartered seal skins with the vessels for supplies. You'll probably detect by now Sutherland was a bit of a prickly character. And what we would call today eccentric. A man of few words who would hold a lifetime feuds and friendships. After around a year on his lonesome, he got the word out to another miner, John Mackay, 
who was seeking his fortune in the same fashion just 40 kilometres up the coast at Big Bay. The twosome soon became a threesome shortly after James Malcolm joined them in what Sutherland now called Milford City. Three huts. What a great photo this is. It catches the moment succinctly. Sutherland and his dong Johnny O'Groot are front and centre. Mackay, Sutherland and Malcolm would all go out prospecting. On one such venture in November 1878, Mackay and Sullivan were out bush bashing together. They would have crossed this river somehow, and that photo is mine by the way, and so are the next two, when they came upon a waterfall and they tossed a coin to see who would name it. Mackay won, continued on another 10 kilometres where they spotted a second waterfall. It was now Sutherland's turn. He made the most of it by climbing the falls were the largest in the world at 4,000 feet, knowing full well at the time it was significantly less. In fact, it wasn't even the tallest waterfall in Fiordland. The Bowen Falls, New Zealand's tallest, were only about an hour by foot from his hut. His hope was a tourist attraction like this would spurn the government into opening either a road or rail route into the area and his plan worked to a certain extent. The government was prompted to send in surveyors into the region to find an inland route and at the same time correctly ascertain the height as per the attached postcard. A reward was offered for anyone who could find a route that would connect Milford to the broader Otago region. That honour would fall to Quinton McKinnon and Ernest Mitchell eight years later. And that's the climb up to the top. When Southern heard the news, he was far from overjoyed. He was really, really, really pissed off. Claimed to the effect, I could have found it at any time I wanted to, and refused to call it McKinnon Pass. Persisted instead with calling it Balloon Saddle, and went on reconnoitres to find a better direct route which he's sure he could find. Sutherland was mostly by now living back on his own as everyone else including Mackay had now left after fruitless searches for the elusive minerals. Seeing the international potential of tourist destination in the middle of the South Island the enthusiastic government of the day paid Sutherland to cut a track to the site of the falls for the expected tourist masses. It took six months to build and now forms part of what we all know as the Milford Track. Later on the government press ganged prisoners between 1890 and 1892 to extend it. Yep, that's a real photo. Originally the prisoners were dutied to build a decent road from Tianau. That exercise proved too hard and they were repositioned into the bush. Now in his 40s he saw the gold was now in tourism and that was the metaphorical track he largely tramped for the rest of his life. In 188, the first year the track from Milford to the Falls opened, they welcomed 40 people off the steamboats. The next season, mostly summer of course, it was 70, and by the third they were in triple figures, 100. That year, 1890, was an auspicious year for him. He took on a partner, a dual life and business partner. Sutherland hated cities and nicknamed anyone silly enough to live in one an Ashfelter. Despite his uh, misanthropic nature, he ended up in Dunedin in 1890 in one of his rare journeys outside Milford where he engaged in a whirlwind courtship with a thrice-married widow named Elizabeth Samuel. When Elizabeth Samuel walked down the aisle for the fourth time with Donald, she was 48 and already a grandmother. She embraced the rugged, lonely lifestyle and together they built a 10-room hotel to serve the burgeoning tourist trade. Milford now had its own version of Basil Fawlty. The reason why there's so few photos of Mr Sutherland is his hatred of photographers. 
Elizabeth came with some money behind her and the couple purchased the entire city for £100. All five acres of Milford remained in the Sutherland's hands till Elizabeth sold out to the government in 1922 for a thousand quid. Over the years they added buildings to the numbers and became more self-sufficient with livestock as ferry frequency went up, as well as the ones that turned up via the cheap route, a journey by foot from Tiaunau. In the down months they were largely still on their own with a dog and pet sandflies for company. On a good day, it rains over 180 days a year by the way, this would have been their view. That was a photo I took, hard to get bored with that. Donald Sutherland died in his hotel in October 1919 when the only other occupant of the town at the time was his wife. Sutherland was always a sturdy six footer plus and with Elizabeth's home cooking and fewer days on the track now he was well into his 70s he was to quote one of the hotel guests as big as a door frame a euthanistic term for a fat bugger so a fat in fact Elizabeth was forced to leave him to decompose on their bedroom floor for five weeks until the steamer turned up and they could move him as mentioned, she sold the hotel and property, lock, stock and barrel, to the government in 1922. Lived there until she died two years later. Now resides next to her husband. And cheers for your time today. This is actually the second video I've done on Fee Woodland. The first one is this. And there's a link below in the description. Another big shout out to the people who plonk my videos on their social media. I've got plenty more NZ stories in the pipeline to recant, so stick around and I'll spot you next time. Bye for now.